Thank you. How are you? Okay, I don't know. That didn't sound that enthusiastic. How are you? You guys in a good mood? Yes? Yes, I know, I know, I know the Ted rules. I shouldn't have notes with me, but I will fight Ted, all right? I, I, I have the attention span, I have the focus of a toddler in a toy store. So if I don't have notes with me, at some point we'll end up deciding whether or not 30 Rock is the Mary Tyler Moore of our generation, and none of us will know how we got there. So I have notes. And I'm excited to be here. I'm really excited to be here. I hope you guys are excited to be here as well. Um, this is an awesome event. I've looked at the list of speakers. I've been watching some of them online. I've been watching, I caught a couple of them here. It's a really exciting event, and I'm excited to be here. But what if I wasn't? What if I wasn't excited to be here? What if I came up here and I was completely apathetic about being here? Just a, eh, whatever attitude. What if I had a great topic, but I gave it to you with no enthusiasm and no energy? What would happen? Or what if I did stand-up comedy, which I do, and I had a really good, I had a really good, I had all the tools to be a really good comedian, but I, but I did my act with no enthusiasm. What if I had good material, and, uh, and I was quick-witted and uh, rugged good looks? <laughs> okay, what if I was quick-witted and had good material? <laughs> But I came up on stage and I didn't care. I was like, eh, it's just an apathetic, whatever, aim for the dirt attitude. You know, hey man, you can't miss, don't even try, you won't embarrass yourself. What would happen? Why would somebody do that? Why would I sabotage myself like that? Well, for me, it was fear. And, 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 and apathy, not caring, is a really good cloak for fear. You know, if I, oh, who cares, well, it doesn't matter, you know? Now, what was I afraid of? This is a, this, I mean, it's so great that it's April Fool's Day because I was afraid of making a fool of myself. That's what I was afraid of. Now, I know it sounds counterintuitive. I'm a stand-up comedian, and my biggest fear is making a fool of myself. It seems like those two should kind of go hand in hand. Maybe one should be a prerequisite for the other. But that's what I was afraid of. I was totally afraid of, of making a fool of myself. Now, I wasn't always afraid of making a fool of myself. When I started in stand-up comedy, I came out on stage, I had a little red suitcase with the words Ton O' Laughs Comedy Kit stenciled on there. I'd done it myself, thank you very much. I, uh, I dropped out of art school and I still had creative passion. Uh, and that was full of all kinds of gags and horrible, stupid jokes, and, and it was just embarrassing. Uh, but uh, I had a guitar, I also had a guitar with me that I could barely play, but I did song parodies horribly. Uh, I had some of the lamest impressions you've ever heard. Um, a Jack Nicholson that sounded an awful lot like a Woody Allen. Um, but I didn't care, you know what I mean? I didn't care, I was having fun, I was going out on stage and I had a couple of people laughing and I was having a good time and I didn't know that I was making a fool of myself. It wasn't until I met the Soul Crushers. And we all know, we all know the Soul Crushers. We all know the jaded ones. They're the ones, they're the ones we, we know, some of them are our family, some of them are our friends, some of them are our coworkers, some of them are our peers. They're the ones who, who take great excitement, great glory in quashing you, in, 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 in knocking your enthusiasm and mocking your optimism and generally just making you feel like a moron for having any kind of passion about doing what you want to do. We all know these people. In comedy, most of the soul crushers are, are other comedians. There are comedians who maybe things aren't going that well or, or they're just not happy with where their career is. So they sit kind of in judgment in the back of the room usually, deeming anybody who's able to get a laugh a hack. You're a hack. But a hack is if somebody can get a laugh. <laughs> you know, it used to be called a comedian, but when Soul Crushers, it's a hack now. So they sit in the back and they call it a hack. And the audience, you're all morons, by the way. Just so you know, when, when, when the, you are, if a joke doesn't get laughed, it's never us, it's you. It's a horrible attitude, but that's the attitude that these guys, you know, that they would have. And then the problem with the soul crushers is it's very easy, it's very easy to get sucked into them, to become one. It's very easy to become jaded. I mean, in stand-up comedy, it's just us. I walk on stage alone. I have nothing but words and thoughts that I offer out to the audience. 
and, and, and I try to make this connection. And if it doesn't work, it's really nice to have a comfortable, easy answer for why that didn't work. And, and to say, oh, the audience was hard. They didn't get you. You're too hip for the room. That was my favorite. You're too hip for the room. It went over their heads. Usually it went under their feet, but you know, <laughs> went over their heads. That's what we would say. That's how you, there's a comfort in that. There's a comfort in, in, in not, you know, not having to deal with that. The problem is that it, it starts to build. So you start to, you start to disconnect from the audience. And so you know, as, as you're pulling yourself away from the audience, you're, you're taking away the very people that a good performance is, is hinging upon. So you know, you're disconnecting yourself from the audience. Now, at some point, you realize that. You realize that you've disconnected from the audience. And you either have to accept the fact that, that you need the audience to be on your side, and you need to work to get them on your side, or you can do what I did, which was to develop an act that didn't need an audience. So what I did was I became a very good joke mechanic. I wrote jokes that, were, that would independently stand on their own. They didn't need an audience. They were separate from me. So if you guys didn't like them, it didn't matter. It didn't affect me. There's no me in my jokes. And they, it, it works. I mean, it works. You can, you can do jokes like that. The problem is that they're very mechanical jokes, and the laughs are very mechanical. There's no connection there. It's like you know, telling a joke that you saw on the internet or telling a joke that you heard in a bar to somebody. It's like, ah, oh, that's good. That's funny. But there's no, there's no connection. There's no back and forth. Um, so I realized that. I mean, I realized that as I was, as I was doing my act, you know, that, that that was happening. But it didn't matter because I was successful. You know, I was getting work. I was getting work with this mechanical act. So who cares? You know, I was, I was going on the road. I was making money. I was able to quit my day job. You know, I was making some dough. I was meeting ladies. Well, I was making money. So. <laughs> As a comedian, you don't actually meet women. I'm sorry. If anybody was thinking about becoming a comedian, the, the <laughs> women come up after comedians, and honestly, they, oh, you were hilarious. I want you to meet my husband. You know, that's, that's what comedians get. But that's where I was. You know, so I had this, I had this act, and I, and I felt good, and I knew I was disconnected. You can feel it. You can feel when you're not connected to an audience. And I knew it. I wasn't stupid. I knew that there wasn't a connect, but I was still intimidated by the audience. I was still too scared to open myself up, to let myself be vulnerable to an audience, to do the work that it would take to, to make that connection. I got to see other comics. This is what kills you as a comic, is when you see somebody you know isn't as talented, quote unquote, talented as you are, getting bigger, better laughs. Because you know what they're doing. They're connecting with the audience. You're not connecting with the audience. And that's more than you can do. You can, you, can, you, can write your, you, know, you can write like crazy. You can write the best jokes. But if you're not connecting, it doesn't matter. So, so I, knew what, I knew what I had to do. But I, 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 just couldn't, I just couldn't get my head around the idea of doing that. I, I, I would every once in a while I'd throw in like an autobiographical joke, a joke that was a little self-deprecating. Uh, and it would get a nicer laugh when it got a laugh. If it got a laugh, it was good. It was solid. I mean, that's an, it's an amazing laugh to get when, you, when, when the audience is with you and you guys are working together, it's, a, it's this amazing laugh. Um, but if it doesn't work, it's a catastrophic failure. When, when a joke like that falls apart, it, it stings because it's a personal joke. It's, it's your joke. It's you. It's not, it's not a product. It's you. And uh, you know, it, 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 there's a, it, it's painful. So I would throw those jokes out if they didn't work because I didn't, I didn't want to feel that. I continued doing my, uh, my act like a salesman. I'd do it convincingly enough to close the deal, but without enough uh, investment so that, that if it didn't work, I wouldn't get hurt if you walked away. So you know, you go on like that, and, and eventually you realize, or at least I realized, that I needed, to, I needed to close that gap, or I needed to get out of the business. Because I just I wasn't enjoying it. My comedy, which I'd wanted to do, I dropped out of college to do comedy. Well, I, I dropped out of art school. I mean, I gave up a lucrative fine arts career uh, to do, to do stand-up comedy. But, but, but I did. I had made an investment, and here I was. This was my dream, and now it felt like a job. And I was hating it. I hated it. I knew I had to do something to change it. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know. I couldn't get my head around doing that. I would try. You know, Like I said, I would 
throw out some autobiographical jokes. Every once in a while, I try to connect with an audience. I mean, I can't tell you how hard it was for me to literally walk up on stage and just look at somebody, hi, how you doing? Hi, how are you? That would, that would kill me right there. That would be, that would be, that'd be in the journal. Oh my God, I actually said hi to somebody in the audience. Uh, that, was, that was amazing. That was amazing to me. Um, but I knew that that's what I needed to do to get that, that connection. And I, there was, I wish I could say I had this, this epiphany. I wish, you know, we all want that aha moment. But it didn't happen. It was just a kind of like little things, little things, little things. I wish I could tell you that, that uh, you know, that, uh, that a kid came up to me in a wheelchair and uh, he said to me, he said, your, your jokes make my heart work again, you know, something like that. Uh, <laughs> You need to follow your passion. Oh! And, and then he turned, he went into the vapor, and it turned out that he was an old comedian who had died of boredom. And oh my God, I should change my. I wish I could tell you that, but that's not what happened. What happened, what it all came out of, was a moment of anger and boredom and frustration. That's exactly what happened to me. I was driving to a show in Pocono, Pennsylvania, and I'd left as late as possibly. Good. I, I, I left myself no time to make it up there because I didn't want to go because I'd lost the passion for it. I didn't want to be there. So I'm driving and, uh, and I'm, I'll tell you how bad it was. I was envious of people who were leaving work. I was like, oh man, they're done. Oh, I have to go tell stupid jokes. I hate this. This thing that all, all I wanted to do all my life and I hated it. And I listened to myself whining. I was like, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? You are, you are going to do what you want to do, and you hate it. you got to get out. Maybe we're done. Maybe this is it. Maybe we're done. That's what I started thinking about for the next hour, was what I was going to do next with half a, half a fine arts degree, uh, <laughs> and a kid, and a wife, and a house. Uh, and, and, I, and I turned on to, and I don't know if you know, uh, going up to the Poconos, we're off of 22 in Allentown. I turned up to 33 North. And I had forgotten what a Friday in June was going to be like driving to the Poconos, and it was a wall of tail lights. I was screwed. I had given myself exactly enough time to get to the show if nobody else was on the highway. <laughs> and now I was sitting in a parking lot, and I picked up my phone to call him and tell him I was going to be late. And, and I saw, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, it looks like, a, like an antenna, it looks like a Y. That's the antenna, and then there's just a big slash through it. <laughs> I had no signal, I had no signal, and I was late, and I was frustrated, and I was so aggravated, and I was like, oh my God, I gotta make it. And I kept picking the phone up, and you keep moving forward, and slowly, and come on, what are you, a moron? Come on! <laughs> and I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving. Every time I look at the phone, no signal, no signal, no signal. And now they're going to have to start the show without me. And I'm going to have to run in and kind of do that kind of crazy run to the stage. Uh, and I picked the phone up to let them know and no signal. And I got so mad because I, look, I convinced myself I was out of the business at that point, but I needed that gig. I needed the money. And I looked at the phone and I went, boom, and I threw it against the dashboard. And I expected that the phone would shatter into these pieces, boom, and it would be awesome. But instead, it bounced up, it hit the windshield, cracked the windshield, and went back and hit me. <laughs> I don't know if anybody here has ever had the kind of blind fury, the anger, where you scream. I wasn't screaming obscenities. It was just a note from my guts, just screaming to the end of the highway and I pulled off and I ran in and they put me right up on stage and as I hit the stage, my logical part of my brain went, all right, man, you can do this. Just, whoosh, we've done this a million times. You're not that, you know, just do your thing. But then my mouth said, I don't think so. We need to talk about this. <laughs> and I told them the story of the phone and the windshield and my head and, and they were laughing, like incredibly like an incredible laughter, like, like, just this, like we were connected, like they had been in the car with me. It was this amazing connection. And uh, it, I, just, I just picked up, I just, oof. It was just like, like lifted. And, and all my jokes, all my, even my old little mechanical jokes I've been doing for five, six years had new life to them, and I had new life to me. And then I, I remember I just, I just got off that stage after that show, and I was like, why well, am I not done doing comedy? I may have just started doing comedy. I may have just figured it out. And I went back to the hotel room, 
And I sat on the bed, and the first thing, of course, I had to figure out was how I'm going to explain to my wife a broken windshield, a broken phone, and a bruise. Uh, I don't know how we're going to explain that somebody else did that. But as I sat there, I also thought back on how the show went and how awesome that show was. And I realized that that show was awesome because, because I raised my level. I opened myself up to the audience, and the audience opened up to me. I realized that you, the audience can only be invested in, in you as you are in them. And it's true in all things. That, that nobody can believe in you more than you believe in yourself. So I, you know, this was this amazing, this was this amazing moment, you know, I realized that. And, and, and it's not just in comedy, it's in everything. It's in, it's in every relationship you have. You need a, a leader with confidence who believes in themselves, whether it's a teacher, student, or it's a parent, child, a boss, employee, a comic, an audience. Nobody, nobody can raise, you, you set the bar and then you, you bring them up to it. It was, it was an amazing moment, and I thought back on this, and it just, it was just, it was just, it was just like I said, it was just amazing. It just made me feel uh, so good. So to go back to the question, what would happen if I came up here and I was completely apathetic and I didn't care? Nothing. Nothing would happen. Nothing would change. You guys would leave, goodbye, see you later. Nothing would change. But nothing seems like a pretty high price to pay for not feeling like a fool. Thank you, guys.